It's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here um, among uh, some very heavy weights, and I'm just delighted to be here with you all. The title of my talk is War, Peace, and Statism. And for those of you who are paying attention, you'll note that I took this from War, Peace, and the State by Murray Rothbard, which is a gem of a short article. I used to be an anarchist before I read this, and now I believe that the government should exist, and it should have one purpose, to force everyone to read this article. <laughs> <laughs> Murray starts with the non-aggression principle, which I regard as the bedrock of libertarianism. Keep your mitts to yourself. Don't grab other people or their property without their permission. I mean, if you ask the next 100 people driving by the highway, do you agree with that? They'd say yes. I mean, most people aren't favoring murder and rape and theft and for, uh, fraud and stuff like that. The difference between the average person and Murray Rothbard and us libertarians is that we mean it seriously and we apply it to everything, not just to other people, but to government as well. Uh, Murray says in this magnificent article, War, Peace, and the State, that you can use violence for defense only we're not pacifists, or some people are pacifists, but you don't need to be a pacifist. There's nothing wrong with violence. In response to, or in retaliation, uh, or in defense against the prior initiation of violence. And you also need a theory of private property rights, because if I come down there and grab your shoes, uh, have I committed violence or not? It depends upon whether you are the rightful owner of your shoes. If you stole them from me yesterday and I'm grabbing them from you today, then you're the bad guy, I'm the good guy. And for that, we have the Lockean, Rothbardian, Hoppian theory of homesteading and a legitimate title transfer theory that any, more, any property title is justified if it can be traced either to homesteading or to voluntary interactions such as buying and selling and renting and uh, gambling and, and gifts and things like that. Murray says that if A attacks B, B may fight back against A, but he can't go through C to get at A, uh, because C is an innocent person. And Murray says that rifles, pistols, spears, things like that are legitimate weapons because they can be pinpointed against guilty people. Now, they're not always used in a proper way, but they can be used in a proper way, whereas Nuclear bombs, atom bombs, things like that can't be pinpointed to the guilty, and therefore they are per se out of keeping with libertarian theory. He says it's now time to bring the state into our discussion. It's not just A and B and C, but there's a government. And he says that any other group that would attack people, we would know what it is. It's theft. Uh, the idea here is that the government is not a uh, legitimate institution. It's not a, taxes are not equivalent to golf club dues. You want to join the golf club? Fine. You have to pay taxes or dues to the golf club or the tennis club? Fine. But you agree to be part of it. But who of us agree to be part of this club called the United States government? None of us did. Therefore, when they come after us demanding money from us, uh, this is highly improper. What he says is that possibly intrastate war can be legitimate, as in the case of revolution, because nobody's going to use an atom bomb intrastate because you know we all live in the state. But interstate war is highly problematic. Here's a quote from him: "All state wars, therefore, involve increased aggression against the state own state's own taxpayers, and almost all state wars, all in modern warfare." involved the maximum aggression murder against innocent civilians ruled by the enemy state. On the other hand, revolutions are generally financed voluntarily and may possibly pinpoint their violence to the state rulers, and private conflicts may confine their violence to the actual criminals. The libertarian must therefore conclude that, while well, some revolutions and some private conflicts may be legitimate, state wars are always to be condemned. Now, I could go on. Uh, explaining and summarizing this article, but what I'd like to do instead is to defend the Rothbardian vision against a person that I think is uh, not a straw man, but a, uh, a good critic of Rothbard, and it's um, Steven Pinker, and here's his book.
Steven Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Before I go into it, I want to build him up so that no one will accuse me of dealing with a straw man. I have a personal liking for this guy. First of all, he was, I won't say the only one, but a preeminent person who defended Larry Summers, the president of Harvard, when Larry Summers uh, postulated that possibly the... Um, the over-representation of men in things like physics, chemistry, mathematics is due to biological uh, background. Uh, this is anathema. You're not supposed to say this. Uh, he lost his job for that. Well, one of the MIT professors in math said that this made her sick to her stomach. All I can say is, lady, if you get sick to your stomach with ideas, maybe you shouldn't be a college professor. But... <laughs> Uh, also, I have a personal debt of gratitude to him uh, in his class that he co-taught with Dershowitz. He used my book, Defending the Undefendable, which is a feather in my cap, but Defending the Undefendable gets to Harvard. The third one is I'm a big sociobiologist or a, a fan of it, and he is a uh, contributor to this theory. Let me build him up a little bit more. He was named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential Scientists and Thinkers in the World in 2004, and one of Prospect and Foreign Policy's 100 Top Public Intellectuals in 2005 and 2008. And I've got a whole paragraph of all the awards that he's won. You don't get to be an eminent Harvard professor without winning some awards. Uh, his books are The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, Words and Rules, The Blank Slate, The Stuff of Thought, plus this book. Uh, I, in my view, Steven Pinker is at least the intellectual equal of other critics of Rothbardianism, such as Robert Nozick, Richard Epstein, Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, Gordon Tullock, Ronald Coase. So I've now built him up. Let me take each of his theses in turn and say why I disagree with it. First of all, the first thesis is that death due to violence is less in modern times than it was in earlier times. We're living in a more peaceful society where fewer people are killed, more innocent people live a, a full life than ever before. And what he's got, and, and what, what he does is he does it per capita. Uh, he, he looks at numbers of deaths. And when I first read this thesis, I thought, you know, surely this guy is, you know, using some controlled substances because, you know, World War I, World War II, Mao, Zedong, Stalin, Hitler, the boys, you know, they killed masses of numbers of people. But what he does, and this is brilliant, uh, what he does is he does it per capita, per capita on the basis of the world's population. So what he's got here, let me see if I can do this. Can everyone see that in the back? OK. Um, what he's got is he, take the Second World War, 55, 000, 55 million people were killed in that, but it's only the ninth worst uh, episode in human history in terms of numbers of deaths. The Mayor Zedong in the 20th century, what I did is I underlined the 20th century, and uh, Mayo, uh, Mayo and the um, <clears throat> Mideast slave trade, number nine down here, and um, First World War, 20th, Russian Civil War, vast numbers of people were killed during those times. But if you look at what I've circled, what I've circled is uh, the Anne Lushan Revolt of the 8th century, where only 36 million people were killed, but that's the, the number one in terms of uh, dividing by the world's population. In other words, there were very few people in the 8th century, and therefore a modest amount of killing, pardon me for saying that, doesn't really rise to, to the fore. And if you look at the 20th century things, it's the 9th place, the 11th place, uh, very low levels of killing compared to earlier years when the number of killings per population was much higher. So that's an interesting theory. And um, let me give you another insight as to how he deals with this relativist stuff. Take the case of drones, the drones that kill people. I, I'm reading from something that was just on Lou Rockwell uh, on uh, October 22nd. CIA chiefs face arrest over horrific evidence of bloody video game sorties by drone pilots. Uh, and the quote goes as follows. 
The Mail on Sunday today reveals shocking new evidence of the full horrific impact of US drone attacks on Pakistan. The damning dossier assembled from exhaustive research into the strikes target set out in heartbreaking detail the deaths of teachers, students, Pakistani policemen. It also describes how bereaved relatives are forced to gather their loved ones' dismembered body parts in the aftermath of strikes. How does um, our man Pinker deal with this? He deals with it in a very different way. And in my view, he deals with it in an intelligent way. Namely, he's a worthy opponent. We've got to smash this guy. <laughs> but, but he's a worthy opponent. Here's what he says. Uh, it's actually a quote from someone else that he's supporting. Quote, where an army previously would have blasted its way into the militants' hideouts, killing and displacing civilians by the tens of thousands as it went, and then ultimately reducing whole towns and villages to rubble uh, with inaccurate artillery and aerial bombing in order to get at a few enemy fighters. Now a drone flies in and lets fly a single missile against a single house where militants are gathered. Yes, sometimes such attacks hit the wrong house, but by any historical comparison, the rate of civilian deaths has fallen dramatically. That's a continuing thesis of his book. So far has this trend come, and so much do we take it for granted, that a single errant missile that killed 10 civilians in Afghanistan was front page news in February 2010. This event, a terrible tragedy in itself, nonetheless was an exception to a low overall rate of harm to civilians in the middle of a major military offensive, one of the largest in eight years of war. Yet these 10 deaths brought the US military commander in Afghanistan to offer a profuse apology to the president of Afghanistan and the world news media play up this event as a major development in the offensive. So what he's saying, he's certainly not favoring drones, but he is saying compared to the previous way that we'd go in and get the bad guys, the drones are surgical uh, precision uh, instruments, whereas the old way we'd just bomb everyone. And it's got a certain low cunning. I mean, you have to give this guy credit. Okay, the, the second thesis of, um, of Pinker is something that Rothbard would be turning over in his grave at. Uh, Pinker is a Hobbesian, and he says that the reason for the diminution in deaths, relatively speaking, and he goes into per 100,000 people per year, uh, the reason for the diminution of deaths is two things that Murray Rothbard stood four square against. One was democracy and the other was the state. So what Pinker is saying is that the reason for these reduced deaths, the first thesis, is democracy and the government. And you can imagine what Rothbard would have thought about that. Okay, now for my criticism of Pinker. First of all, he does not confront libertarian critics. This book is about 900 pages. No, it's only about 800 pages of very small print. It's um, a very intense scholarly book. It has uh, about 900 citations to the literature. I didn't count them all, but it was 30 pages on the average page. There were 30, so 30 times 30 is 900. 900 citations He had a, uh, in a bibliography. He had 1,955 footnotes. And this was added, easy to count because I just added up the end of the footnotes at each chapter. And they were uh, four for his introduction, and 55, 82, 182, 162, 257, 291, 308, 298, and 293, and 23 for his last uh, chapter. 1955 footnotes. And yet, he mentioned the virtues of democracy scores of times. Democracy, we're all as democracy is great, democracy is wonderful. Does he have room to even mention Hans Hoppe's magnificent book, Democracy, the God That Failed, The Economics and Politics of Monarchy? No. He nowhere mentions that. That's not the, the work of a reasonable scholar. And he does mention libertarianism, and he actually accurately understands libertarianism, but he doesn't mention Hans' magnificent book. He mentions the evils of anarchy scores of times. Let me just read one very quick one, sort of a, a, a throwaway line. Uh, to be, this is on page 266. To be sure, the American-led wars in Afghanistan and Iraq in the first decade of the 21st century showed the country is far from reluctant to go to war. But even they are nothing like the wars of the past. In both conflicts, the interstate war phase was quick and by historical standards, low in battle deaths. Most of the deaths in Iraq were caused by the intercommunal violence in the anarchy that followed. 
I mean, it's just sort of a throwaway line. I, I, I remember uh, Buchanan, I once invited him to speak at Loyola University. By the way, let me put in a plug for Loyola University. Five out of five economics people are all free market Austrian people. So if you have children or grandchildren, send them to us. We discuss Marxism and Keynesianism too, but we criticize it. Whereas at most places, they just give them Marxism and Keynesianism. And you know, in our sociology department, we have the, you know, the usual pinko, so they won't be bereft of that if they come. <laughs> so send your kids down. He mentions evils of anarchy scores of times. Can you find the name Rothbard in his book? No. I mean, Murray Rothbard is the dean of, uh, of uh, uh, laissez-faire capitalist anarchy or anarcho-capitalism, and he has no room to even mention him. Now, I wouldn't mind if he mentioned Hoppe and, and, uh, and Murray and criticized them. Fine, that's fair game. But to just ignore him, it's, uh, in Yiddish, there's a word schwach, uh, crap. I mean, this is, th th this is, this is not kosher. Th this is, and Pinker is Jewish, as am I, as was Murray, so we can use these words, I guess. This is not uh, good scholarly behavior. Uh, the third one, he mentions the wild, wild west in the US dozens of times. I'm not going to read any, take it from me. He mentions it all over the place. There was an article by Terry Anderson and Peter P.J. Hill in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, quote, the title, An American Experiment in Anarcho-Capitalism, the Not-So-Wild, Wild West, which is a 180-degree contradiction to what he's saying. Does he mention this? Does he say why Anderson and uh, Hill were wrong? No, he just sort of ignores it. That's, that's not cool. Another problem I have with him is he doesn't like our man Adolf. Okay, fine, I don't like Adolf either. But he keeps supporting democracy and Adolf Hitler came to power through a democratic process, dagnabbit. I mean, it wasn't a coup d'etat. Hitler didn't come to power through a coup d'etat. It was a complex thing where he didn't have a majority, had a plurality. Uh, it was a complicated uh, thing in 1936, I guess it was, when he took over. But it, it, that was a democracy. Germany was a democracy. And he keeps talking about how great democracy is, and he keeps putting the Hitler deaths in, in, the, bad, in the bad group. And he uh, merrily goes along saying democracy is great. Well, if democracy is so great, you gotta put Hitler on the other side of the ledger. He doesn't. That, I think, is problematic. It's not that he has his thumb on the balance. He's got his elbow on it. <laughs> uh, Peter just mentioned, uh, before me, Peter Klein mentioned the interstate highways. Do you know how many people die in the interstate highways, or all the highways, the government highways, the socialist government highways? It's around 40,000 a year. For many years, it was 40, it was 38, 36. If you take 100 years of that, you get 4 million people, roughly, which would be equivalent to the Napoleonic Wars. 4 million people died there. Just that alone would be equivalent to uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Does he count highway deaths? Give me a break. Of course he doesn't count highway deaths. I have a book out on that. Uh, it's a very lovely book. It's for sale. Go get it. Uh, it's also available for free on the web thanks to the Mises Institute, which does that sort of a thing. And what it does is says that, you know, we could have private highways. And if we had private competitive highways, people would compete, among other things, as to how to reduce deaths. You know, maybe, for example, the problem with highways is not speed. Maybe it's the variation in speed. Who knows? But when you have one rule of the road emanating from Washington, D.C., you don't have uh, the I-10 or the I-55 I uh, corporation making slightly different rules so that we could see which way will reduce deaths more. You just don't have that. Another, one of my favorite things to say is that the government is responsible for everything bad. For example, uh, hurricanes. We just had Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and I was roundly condemning the government. How? Because they take half the GDP and they fruit it away on wasteful things, and as Peter was talking about alternative costs or opportunities foregone, if we had that half of the GDP back, maybe we would have solved uh, hurricanes. Who knows? Now, this is speculative. We, we can't tell for sure, but it's entirely possible. Cure for cancer. Well, if we had half the GDP back, maybe we wouldn't have to have these pink ribbon things for breast cancer or other things like that. Maybe we could solve that problem. Speculative, we don't know. I can't say we would have, but we would have had a shot at it, whereas now they take half the GDP and, and waste it. 
of the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration kills people on a massive scale. Now, there are two kinds of errors that they make. First is the thalidomide kind of error. They allow a bad medicine through. And in the case of thalidomide, it didn't kill people, but it created birth defects. But they were stung by that, and now they create the opposite kind of error, namely not allowing good drugs to get through. The estimates are it costs, I don't know, a $800 billion to get a new drug through, and it takes 15 years. There's this guy, Sam Peltzman, who I'm not a big fan of since he's a University of Chicago type economist, but on this, he's magnificent. And what he does is estimates the number of people killed by the FDA not allowing uh, drugs to get through. I mean, how can the FDA help? All it does is it prevents things. What the FDA could do, if it had any, uh, any sense of morality, would say, well, we don't approve of that, but if you do it, you're on your own. I mean, there are people on their deathbeds, and they want to try some uh, drug, apricot pits, God knows what. And the FDA said, well, you haven't proved that it's uh, beneficial, and you haven't had these tests for 22 years. Therefore, we're not going to allow you to throw uh, the dice for your own life. That's despicable. Does my man Pinker, does he talk about the FDA deaths? No, he doesn't talk about that. And yet there are estimates that something like, uh, what is it, um, 10, 000, no, 80,000 deaths? There are various measures. Peltzman and others are measuring how many people die as a result of the FDA. And it's into the tens of thousands. There's another one, markets and used body parts. This one, I don't know why it concerns me, but it really does. Uh, you're not allowed to have a market in kidneys, in, in uh, hearts, in livers, in blood, in eyes, in, in all sorts of things. Why? Because, you know, uh, it's evil to have markets. I mean, it's okay to give, but you can't give for money because money is evil. So as a result, this really infuriates the economist in me because you have people going to their graves, taking perfectly good body parts with them, and other people are dying over here because they can't get those body parts. And then the, the, these doctors are making rules as to you know, who can get them. Well, if you smoke, you can't get them. If you're too old, you can't get them. And they have all sorts of rules. If you vote Republican, you can't. No, I'm kidding about that one. <laughs> you, you know what they call motorcycles? Donor mobiles. <laughs> Why do they call motorcycles donor mobiles? Because the people that ride them are usually 22. Now, I'm 71, so my, my innards aren't going to be lasting too long. You don't really want my innards. You want somebody, and especially if uh, an old person dies of some sort of debilitating disease, then all of his um, organs are you know, compromised. But you get a 22-year-old kid on a motorcycle who smacks up, and now he's got perfectly good organs, but you can't get them because he couldn't sign a contract. My time's up, you rotten. <laughs> OK, well. Uh, I, I guess uh, Peter is bigger than me, so uh, he's going to pull me off the stage. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>